Amen. Uh, you can be seated for just a few moments. Just uh, wanted to uh, to maybe address the uh, the issue that's going on in our world right now with regards to, of course, the virus that seems to be spreading rapidly. And uh, before I do that, I'd like you all to do something if you could. Uh, you've all got cell phones. Most of you got cell phones. Can you do you know where the off on button is? Can you can you hit the off button? Amen. For just about an hour, we can do without any texts or games or other things. Uh, the scripture they'll put up here in case you're worried about it. They'll, they'll have that up here for you. And uh, we want to center our attentions in on God. We don't want to be distracted by other things, do we? Amen. But like alarms going off and amen. People calling us. Listen, I've had that happen while I was preaching, so... Uh, I'm, I've <laughs> and you think it's embarrassing when it happens in the congregation. You should be preaching when it happens. <laughs> and uh, then you would say, oh yeah, yeah, I did forget to turn that thing off. Amen. Everybody got your phones off? Oh, good. Well, some of you do. Um, just we have this, this virus going around, and I, I try and as much as is possible to stay away from political issues and various issues that are going around in our world. I like to keep my preaching based on Jesus Christ and Him crucified and how that applies to our lives. But uh, because of what is happening, I know the Bible says that there are pestilences and diseases that will be prevalent in the last days. And it does say that. So we should not be surprised by things that are going on in our world. And I do believe that, that God has His hand upon His church. Amen. That doesn't mean that we'll be immune, but it does mean that we will handle whatever comes our way with God at the foremost of our lives. Everybody said amen. And we will trust Him through each and every circumstance and situation. That is the essence of faith. That is the essence of our belief system is that we will put our trust and our faith in the one that has our lives in His hands. The Bible says that He is faithful and just to not only forgive our sins, but He is going to be faithful to complete the work that He began in us. And I'm thankful for that promise. I, there are times that I, I worry about myself um, because of my humanity, but I put faith in the Word of God and God's promises to me that He is going to complete this work. I need to keep my heart, my mind, my eyes, my attention focused on Him. And if I do so, He will be faithful to complete those things within me. I would ask you that you would pray. Pray for those that uh, just this morning uh, we saw this thing on Spain. Of course, Spain has closed their borders now as well uh, to travel and, uh, and other nations are doing so as well uh, just to try and prevent the spread of it. And for that, uh, I think it's good to be safe and feel safe as much as is possible. Um, but on the other side of it, God is our keeper. Amen. God is our healer, and He is our deliverer, and He will keep us, and He will keep His hand upon us. Everybody said amen. amen. Hallelujah. Having said that, let's stand together, and uh, we're going to read a passage of Scripture. I did mention that we're going to be preaching from the book of Acts a bit. I've been, uh, I've been, I lost the book of Acts. Oh, there it is. See? Uh, been doing this uh, reading uh, the book of Acts uh, a bit over the last little while and then going back over it a bit for myself and uh, just kind of refreshing my memory regarding a lot of the instances and happenings that happened uh, through the beginning of this early church. And uh, just I want to just give you information. If you're wanting to know what the church was like at the beginning, read the book of Acts. It's the only history that we have of the way that the church was like at the beginning. I, the first four books of the Gospels are, are, liter, are literally are the first four books are the Gospels that talk about the history of the life of Jesus. The book of Acts deals with the history of the church. And then, of course, we go into letters to the churches or to all of us. And lastly, of course, is Revelation, future things, some of which we understand well, some of which we have lots of opinions. And I could probably go to each one of you here and you're all going to have a different opinion because you see prophecy is never clear completely until it is in the past. The, the Old Testament prophets prophesied about a lot of things, but they did not see clearly. They prophesied about some things. In retrospect, we look back and say, yes, that's 
That's what happened. That's what they were talking about. And in retrospect, at the end of time, we'll be able to look back at the book of Revelation and say, yeah, that was my opinion and my thoughts on all of this, but this is the way that it actually happened. And God's got it all in His hands, and I'm thankful for that. Glad it's not up to me. Everybody say, I'm glad it's not up to me. Amen. Acts chapter 14. I'm going to read uh, uh, 19 through 22. And the only reason for reading this passage of Scripture in its entirety is to give you context, or at least this particular uh, portion, uh, for one verse in the middle that I'm going to be preaching on for a little while today, and that is verse 22. So let's start in verse 19, and uh, we want to read through to verse 23. But Jews came from Antioch and Iconium, and having persuaded the crowds, they stoned Paul and dragged him out of the city, supposing that he was dead. But when the disciples gathered about him, he rose up and entered the city, and on the next day he went on with Barnabas to Derbe. And when they had preached the gospel to that city and had made many disciples, they returned to Lystra and to Iconium and to Antioch, strengthen, strengthening the souls of the disciples, encourage them to, encouraging them to continue in the faith, and saying that through many tribulations we must enter the kingdom of God. And when they had appointed elders uh, for them in every church with prayer and fasting, they committed them to the Lord in whom they had believed. And I want to center your attention on verse 22. Uh, they went to all these other churches again, strengthening the souls of the disciples, encouraging them to continue in the faith, and saying that through many tribulations we must enter the kingdom of God. I, this has been in my heart my mind for a while already since I read it. And I uh, just, uh, yeah, it's interesting. We think that entrance into the kingdom of God is simple. And it's just, you know, I believe, therefore I'm in. Just that simple. Uh, scripturally, we've got a lot of to contest regarding that. So I'm going to preach to you about the struggle today. And... Uh, just, uh, I want you to bear with me and stay with me. The Bible does talk about it a lot and uh, this warfare that we're in and the struggle we sometimes have. And so I want to preach to you about that for just a little while. Can you pray together with me? Father, we just love you so very much. I thank you, Lord, for your great work in each one of our lives. Father, I'm just so grateful today that I'm your child. I thank you for all the promises that you have made Father, for each and every one of us within this church, with all of your children, Father, you've even promised that for those that are not a part of this kingdom, this church, Lord, that you would, uh, it's still your desire, Jesus, that all would come to a place of repentance, that all should be saved. So I know that you're working in those that are around us, but I'm so thankful for your presence in my life today. Father, I just pray that you'll just anoint me as I preach. Anoint uh, those that are here in this house. Thankful for them. Thankful for each soul that's here. Father, I just pray that you'll anoint their heart, their ears, their mind to receive your word. For without it, Lord, I, I just feel like your word will fall on, on wayside ground, that it'll just be gone in a moment. But Father, I know that if you will do the anointing, prepare the ground, Father, that your word can change each and every one of us. Father, not only for those that are here, I pray, Lord, for those that may be watching live, those that may even download or watch later through YouTube or other channels, other ways, Lord, I pray that you will anoint them as well. Let your word work in each life, in Jesus' precious name. And everybody said amen. 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 You may be seated in Jesus' name. I love seeing that thing on or the little blurb of the foreign missions on Bangladesh, uh, I received a blurb the other day or a little poster saying that uh, uh, to sign up to go to the next crusade in Bangladesh, which is, I think, next February, beginning of next February. And uh, so I, uh, I sent him an email to go. And uh, when I come back, if, I, if I'm accepted and if I'm able to go, I'll bring you back actual footage from my camera and show you exactly. Wouldn't that be awesome? Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. What an awesome God we serve. I'm thankful for the miracles that are done in so many areas and so many places. My wife and I and some of you have seen some great miracles that God has done. 
it's not just relegated to third world countries. God's done some great miracles here in this country. And I've seen the dead raised. I've I myself experienced God's healing in my body instantaneously and miraculously. I've also uh, experienced where God healed me gradually through time. And both are biblical. I don't know if you knew that or not. Not every healing is instantaneous. Some are through time. Uh, instantaneous healings are referred to as miracles in the Bible. And the Bible talks about both healings and miracles. And uh, so there are healings that God will keep us through time. And you know what? Sometimes God, He works through the things that He allows to come in our lives. And, and He's so good at it. We listen to this on a podcast. He's so good at making sometimes the negative things that happen to us into positive outcomes that sometimes we credit Him with having brought those bad things into our lives. Yeah. When in the, That's not true. He, uh, we live in a world where it rains on the just and the unjust. And, and so there are things that are going to be happening to us that are good and that are bad, along with the rest of this world. And uh, But God's hand is going to be on His people, and aren't you glad for that? Amen. Amen. I wanted to talk to you about the struggle. Paul says in, on this unusual, well, it is him talking because he was the one that, that initiated this conversation that we stopped at here and we looked at this particular verse. He says to those that are in Lystra and Iconium and Derby and all the rest of it, he says these words that uh, through much tribulation we must enter the kingdom of God. And, and I was thought about that and I thought, how, why? Why is it so difficult? Why do, would we have to go through struggles and, and trials? Why would we have to go through negative things in our lives or encounter negative things in our lives? in order that we would become part of the kingdom of God. So before we get to the actual struggle and we talk about that a little bit, I do need to just talk about the kingdom for just a moment. Romans chapter 14 verse 17 <clears throat> says these words, says the kingdom of God is righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. I must have been tired this morning. I spelled righteousness wrong. <laughs> hey, Amen. If you were reading this, you'd wonder what I had written. Uh, the kingdom of God is righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. Um, let, me, let me just talk to you for just a moment ab about this kingdom. It is about us living in the Spirit as opposed to in the flesh. Amen. I think Teresa talked about that this morning, didn't she? It's not about catering or living according to the dictates. Now, your mind, your will... Your wisdom all, or your strength. It's about living in the power, the wisdom, the understanding, the leading of the Holy Ghost that God has filled you with and living in that. That's what this kingdom, this church, that's what this is all about. That's what the kingdom is. And, and so when, when Paul's talking about entering into the kingdom of God, he's talking about the church of God. He's talking about us living in victory. He's talking about us living in joy. He's talking about us living in righteousness. He's talking about us living with peace in our lives. And you know what? I find that for myself and those that I pastor and those that I know, that quite often it seems like we fall a little bit short of living in the Holy Ghost where we have God's righteousness, God's peace, and God's joy in our lives. And so I want to encourage you today that it is still God's will and God's desire, God's intent, that we be able to understand that this is what He wants for our lives. He wants us to be kingdom-minded. He wants us to have that kingdom mentality where when... My wife went and asked me, she said, what is the difference between us and other people who fall? And I said, the difference is, is when, when we fall or when we fail or when we struggle or when we trip and, and whatnot, that it drives us back to the cross again. That it brings us back to the feet of Jesus to say, Lord, I need you to be greater in my life. Yeah, I've fallen. Yes, I've failed. Yes, I'm struggling with this. But God, I need you. And you know what? God's not discouraged by your failures or your weaknesses. He knew all of them before He called you. How can He be discouraged about them when you bring them to Him and say, Lord, this is my problem that I have in my life right now. So, I want us to be able to have that kingdom 
mindedness, that, that kingdom mentality where, where when we fall or when we find ourselves so worried that we lose the peace, we are so filled with anxiety. I want you to know that uh, I took a psych class, of course. One of the greatest drugs that is used nowadays, legal of course, is for anxiety and worry in our generation. Did you know that? Greater than cigarettes, greater than alcohol, greater than all the rest of them is the drugs that, that are there for anxiety and worry. I want you to know something today. We've got the greatest relief, the greatest solution to this world's anxiety and worry, and that is in the Holy Ghost, in Jesus Christ. There's a constitution, U.S. Constitution, say, uh, what is it, The Pursuit of Happiness. And how many have seen the movie, The Pursuit of Happiness, and with uh, Will Smith in it? All The whole movie is about him making money. For goodness sakes, that's not happiness. That's a temporary fix for happiness. Happiness is having your joy that is in Him and in Him alone. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. So, the kingdom of God, uh, Jesus said to Nicodemus, let me, I'll just touch on these very quickly and then we'll get into the struggle. Uh, uh, Jesus said to Nicodemus, you must be born again of water and of spirit or you cannot enter into the kingdom of God. And then he says this as well, you must be born again in that same way or you cannot even see what the kingdom of God is like. I want you to know, how many of you would rather take what psychologists and psychiatrists say than what the Holy Ghost is talking to you about? Listen, we live in a world where it seems like that we'll go anywhere else except to God. We'll go anywhere else except to the Holy Ghost. We'll go anywhere else except to the Word of God. Listen, we need to grab a hold. I'm not saying anything against them. If you need it, you need it, and you have to go there. But our primary and first instinct should be, God, I've got to get a hold of you. God, I've got to have a better relationship with you. God, there's something missing in my life. I need more of you in my life. And I've wondered about some things, you know. I think sometimes uh, we just, uh, we're so filled with self that we, God can't fill us with all that He wants to fill us with. Listen, um, it's pretty arrogant of man to believe that you can figure out God by yourself. Why God would do something. And Teresa was talking about baptism and being a spiritual thing. We don't understand some stuff that God asks for or it says that we should do. But we understand that there's a spiritual application in our lives for something physically that we do uh, in obedience to God's Word. So you must be born again in order to enter into the kingdom of God. Uh, Acts 2.38 is an obvious and, and uh, completion of what Jesus told Nicodemus in John chapter 3. When Peter finished preaching on the day of Pentecost and they asked men and brethren, what shall we do? He said, repent and be baptized, obviously in the name of Jesus and uh, for the remission of your sins and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost and the promises unto you and to your children and all their, those that are far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. This is such an obvious correlation between what Jesus said to Nicodemus that it cannot be ignored or misconstrued or changed or in any way, shape or form. The kingdom of God is there. Peter was given the keys, right? right, right. In order for, for you to enter into a door, you've got to have the right key. Peter was given the keys and he used them on the day of Pentecost at the beginning of this church age that we are a part of. Now, you wouldn't think that would be difficult. That doesn't seem like a struggle, does it? I mean, yeah, I believe the obvious next step is I should be baptized in Jesus' name. Why then is it such a struggle in people's minds and hearts to be able to do such a thing. Because there is a certain amount of opposition to doing the right thing. There is. There's opposition and, and we have three different areas of opposition that, that come against us to do the right thing. The first opposition that's, is the world. Let's just say the world because that's typically what we think of as, as one of the greatest. We also think of Satan, so we'll, we'll talk about that. Well, let's do Satan first. Satan is, walking, is going around the world seeking whom he may devour. So can I tell you right now, he wants to devour you. But he's not just interested in you. 
He's interested in every soul, every man, everybody that's there. He wants them all. He is a devouring demon that desires to destroy people's lives, people's homes, people's bodies, people's minds, people's spirit. He will do whatever he can to try and destroy and devour everything that would attempt and want to be godly. So you got a little bit of opposition, right? Second part of it is the world. Now the Bible talks about New Testament. There are three things in the world that are a problem for all of us. First of all, lust of the eyes. Yeah, lust of the flesh. And then the pride of life. So, three things. Lust of things that you want and desire. Things you... Listen, all the advertisement in the world, it's appealing to our lust. Listen, how many of you have looked at an advertisement and say, I've got to have that? And then you ordered that thing either through Amazon or wherever it is or went out to Canadian Tire or what have people are covering their eyes and went and bought it and found out you got that thing home and it <laughs> wasn't at all and it didn't work the way that it looked like it was supposed to work. And, and all, after a while, your cupboards are full of things that you don't use anymore. <laughs> no, <I'm laughs> Amen. Have any of you been there besides me? What is it that draws us to that stuff? It's the lust of things in this world. I've got to have that. And so you go about it. And boy, Amazon has sure made it easy, hasn't it? I love Amazon. <laughs> Free delivery if you've got Amazon Prime, right? Yes. Uh, <laughs> we're... Ethan gets gifts all week long. Every day he gets gifts from Amazon. My wife says she didn't want it to be him. Yeah. So we get all those things. But the, then there's the lust of the flesh. It's our innate desires. You want to know what they are? Sexual. Yeah. Eating. Yeah. The natural things that we do to exist and that are a part of our existence, a part of our makeup. If taken out of control, we're... Where I'll tell you what lust does. Lust is only concerned with itself. So if there's lust in me, I'm not worried about how it damages other people. I'm not worried about how it damages my body or, or whatnot if I overindulge in certain things. All I'm worried about is how much of those pierogies can I eat today? <laughs> uh, the, I'm reading a pocketbook that at the end of every chapter it's got a recipe and... and the, they had these, it's not called progies, it was a Russian dish, and, and they made it the same way, but they filled it with just meat, different types of meat. And I thought to my, and then sour cream, and I thought, oh, I was almost drooling while I was reading. No. <laughs> lust. Lust makes you want things that, that should be in their proper perspective, just supposed to help you live and exist, but are taken out of control and as a result of that, damage yourself, you damage others, people's lives. Lust in a sexual way doesn't care about the results of it. What kind of damage you may be doing to family, the individual that you're lusting of, uh, it only thinks of pleasing itself, and it damages. Uh, so, and the last one is pride and uh, pride of life. Uh, they're, they're, we're an arrogant people, generally, because I think I know everything. I think I've got it all together. I think I have all the answers. And you want to know something? It's almost so dangerous when you think that you have all the answers because once you have all the answers and you've got it all together, then God is put off to the side and you stop figuring this little thing out. Just one little phrase. I could be wrong. Think about it. I could be wrong. And when you finally get to that, maybe oh, it's old age, I'm not sure. Because when I was in my 30s and my youth, I honestly, if you'd known me then, you'd know I was the wisest person in the world. I really had all the answers back then. As I've gotten older, I've realized some things. There's, a, I, there's a, more that I don't know than I know. The more I study the Word of God, the more I understand that God has so much more for me to understand, so much more for me to, to realize. And, and I believe that God's going to reveal as much as what is needed for my life as I read, as I study, as I pray. He's going to reveal it and open it up to me. And there's things that I won't know till I get to be there. And I'm glad He's going to show that to me too as well. 
Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. So, uh, those are things. But the la- and then we talked about Satan, we talked about the world. The last thing, the Bible also says, uh, love not the world or the things of the world, because all of those things are going to be destroyed. The world is going to be destroyed and the lust thereof. So all of that stuff, listen, there's going to come a time when everything that this world has lusted after is going to be gone and the lust along with it. Amen. Uh, the last, of course, uh, enemy that fights against us doing the right thing is our own humanity, or let's put it in Bible terms, carnality. In amongst that, it's tied together with this other part of this worldly uh, thing that fights against us, and that is our ego and our pride. This, this flesh. There's weaknesses in this flesh. There's pride in this flesh. And so when we come at the beginning of service or we come to prayer on Monday nights, let me just stop there for a moment. We need more people praying here on Sunday or Monday nights. We need more younger people praying here on on Monday nights and 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 on Tuesdays at Bible study. We need we need you to be there. This is my one opportunity on Tuesdays to be able to do some teaching and and uh, and other than that, it's preaching on Sundays. So uh, need to be there. We need, listen. My wife and I, when we first came to God, and, and the, the gosses, some of you others will remember what it was like when we first came to God. We had uh, two services on Sunday. Uh, did we have anything going Monday? No, I don't think so. We had Tuesday night service. Then we had Thursday night service. Her and I were in charge of the youth group, so we had youth group on Friday. Saturday morning we had outreach, and Saturday night we had prayer meeting. And then we come back to Sunday again and have two services. That's the way it was when, when we came into the church. Now, we've gradually, through time and whatnot, we're down to one service on Sunday. We have one prayer meeting on Monday night, and we have one Bible study on Tuesday night. And then if you're involved in it, you, of course, got your, your home groups as well. I would think that even in our busy world, we could be faithful to those ones, wouldn't you? Everybody said amen. I may be meddling a little bit and just, uh, but that's okay. I'm, I'm the pastor. I, I can get away with it. So let's get into the struggle. Now that we know the enemy, we know that, the, oh, let me, I need to stop just for a moment. Paul is not just talking about the original entrance into the kingdom of God, but he's talking about those times that we fall out of that business of righteousness, peace, and joy of making sure that we struggle to get back in. Now, most of you would assume that this is a, it's because he was stoned at Lystra that he's talking about these things, right? That's what you're thinking. But, but look at the Scripture. In this short passage of Scripture, he left Lystra after being stoned, thought he was dead. He went back out there and he came back to life again. He wrote... A whole lot later, he says, I know a man, whether in the flesh or in the spirit, I know not, who ascended up into the third heaven. He was as dead. As they, they made no mistake. He was dead. But when he went out there, he got back up again, went back into the city and eventually. Now he went to Derby, and they preached there and they established what? Elders, disciples. They established them. How long does it take to establish somebody in the Word? Well, Probably minimum of three years, right? So, and then he's going back and he's going back to these areas that he had already preached in. So we're not talking about, I mean, they happen consecutively in that one paragraph that we read and it happens so quickly, you almost think that the one follows the other. But in between, he went and started a church in Derby and established elders and established disciples there before he went back and reestablished the ones that are at Lystra and Iconium and so forth. And so there's a gap there. So he's not necessarily talking about that, but he is talking about making sure that people stay in the kingdom. So the entrance into the kingdom is absolutely essential and, and of course, with much tribulation, Paul said. Now, now I can get to the definition of the word tribulation. Are you all ready? It's really complicated. It means pressure, trouble, or anguish. Primarily, the word means pressures that burden your spirit. That's the primary definition according to the Strong's Concordance. Also part of the definition is distress of a woman in childbirth. And lastly, also persecution. Those things is what the, 
word tribulation means in this passage of Scripture. Shouldn't be that difficult for us to get in the kingdom. Should be easy because it doesn't seem that, and yet people fight. I'll, I'll give you the first thing that, that makes it a struggle. And it's a struggle when we first come to God, and it's a struggle when we continue to live for God because of our ego, okay? You guys all with me? Okay, you're, you're all awake and you're all with me, right? Okay, the first one is repentance. Why is repentance so difficult? Without repentance, you're not going to see God. The Bible says so. Without repentance, you can't move any further into the kingdom of God because you have to die to yourself. So why is repentance so difficult? Can I tell you why? Because I have the answer, right? <laughs> Aren't you glad? <laughs> because you see, it means that we have got to take ownership for who we are. Whoa. You want to know something? It's a lot bit easier for me to blame you for my bad spirit. Yeah, it's a lot easier for me to blame you for my bitterness or my anger. It's a lot easier for me to blame somebody else for why my life isn't the way that it should be. But I'll tell you something. Repentance is taking ownership of who you are and what you are and then bringing that ownership to God and saying, God, this is me. I don't know how you can accept me. I don't know how you can wash me clean. I don't know how you can make me better. But this is all of me. I'm bringing you my hopes. I'm bringing you my dreams. I'm bringing you my faults. I'm bringing you all my depression, my discouragement, my pride, my lying, my all of it, the lust, whatever it is. God, this is me. What can you do with this? And so repentance is coming to God and saying, God, I can't change this. I need you to change what this is. And so that's a hard thing. Find it that there are so many books out there, lots of self-help books, lots of books that will uh, try and help you through this process of, of uh, being able to take accountability for your own life. Listen, nobody can, can make you do anything. We choose to be who we are and we can choose to be gods or we can choose to try and solve it through the world's system. We have that choice. And, and so that's a difficult process. Repentance is difficult. People would much rather just say, I, you know, oh yeah, I believe in God, so therefore I must be saved. But you need to go to the next step. You need to go to repentance. You need to go to that place. And uh, there's, I, I wrote down a list. There's lust, which thinks of only itself. There's pride, which eliminates God out of your life because the Bible says that God resists the pride, proud. Um, there's anger that leads to bitterness and bitterness that leads to a person being defiled completely. And all of those come because of unforgiveness in our lives. There are habits and addiction, addictions that destroy body and spirit. There's greed, there's lies, deception, there's hurts and there's wounds and there's so many things in our lives. Sometimes it just, if you look around, it'll just break you. And I was driving down 4th Avenue the other day with John and there's this, girl that sits off to the side on the right hand side heading over to John's place and she's just about always there she's just all, almost always just sitting on the sidewalk over there leaning up against a fence and and uh, I mentioned it and John said yeah it's just really sad isn't it and yes it is it's the saddest thing when you see people's lives and where they've come to but you want to know something it's sad when, when we have the opportunity to say yes to God, to put aside the preconceived ideas and all our ego and all our pride and just say yes to God. And it shouldn't be a difficult thing, but it is. And Paul is addressing that struggle in chapter 14 of the book of Acts. Why is it difficult? The people getting baptized in Jesus' name should not be a difficult thing. Now, I know for, for years, since about 300 A.D., they baptized in titles, which is the Father, Son, Holy Ghost, and consider that to be the same thing and have said so. Let me just tell you, it's not the same thing. There's no power in the names or the names, the titles, Father, Son, Holy Ghost. There is only one name that is given under heaven whereby we must be saved, and that is the name of Jesus. Colossians 3.17 says, Whatsoever you do in word or deed, do it all in the name of Jesus Christ. Everything we do should be done in the name of Jesus. And, and so uh, it shouldn't be a difficult thing, but you notice the early church? How many have read the book of Acts recently? You notice the early church? You know, when they were brought into prison, there's three or four times at the beginning of the book of Acts they were brought into prison. You know what they were told to do when they left? They were beaten. 
They were admonished. They were told, says, it's all right for you to go out and preach and teach, but it do something. Eliminate the name of Jesus from your teaching and preaching, and you'll be fine. Why on earth is there so much opposition to the name of Jesus in, in baptism, in repentance, in the infilling of the Holy Ghost, in prayer? It's almost like people feel like it's going back to a, being a child where you know, you're singing about Jesus, believing in Yes, it is. For except you become like little children, you cannot enter into the kingdom of God. You've got to get back to that faith in the name. That faith in the one that died for you. That faith in, in Jesus' name. The Bible says at the end of time in, in Paul's letter to Timothy, he said in the latter days, uh, perilous times shall come. And then it goes through a long list of things that are going to be happening in the end days. But there's one part at the very end, they will have a form of godliness or religiousness, but they will deny the power thereof. In other words, they'll be good churchgoers, They'll be good churchgoers, but they won't be using Jesus' name because the Bible says there is no other name given under heaven whereby we must be saved. And, and so they're not going to use that name. And the second way that the church has power is in the Holy Ghost. For you shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you. Hey, I want you to know there will be lots of religious people that will deny the name of Jesus and deny the Holy Ghost in this day and age. But I want you to know that this church is always going to put the name first. Amen. This church is always going to believe in the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Let's stand for a moment, shall we? Amen. I thought I was going to be really short today. Oh, yeah. It's only 1230. I've got another hour to go yet. I can do this. Amen. <laughs> Who said amen? John. Thank you, John. <laughs> All right. Everybody stretch. Stretch. That's it. You want to do some jumping jacks yet too? You get the blood flowing? Okay, there you go. Shake it, you know, get the kinks out of the neck. Everybody say hi to your neighbor. <laughs> Amen. Okay, you can be seated. Alrighty. The last thing is, uh, is of course, uh, that's a part of our initial uh, conversion or initial entry into the kingdom of God is is the baptism of the Holy Ghost because you've got to be born of water and of spirit. Uh, I, this is a, in our day and age, it seems like it's one of the things that is, seems to be fought against the most. Um, lots of people like the traditional type services and traditional type of church. The Holy Ghost just doesn't like that. <laughs> likes it when Terry or Rob or somebody else gets up and runs around the church. The Holy Ghost likes to be spontaneous, likes people to... Listen, the fact is, the Bible goes so far as to say that you better not quench the Holy Ghost as children of God. Now, quench means to hold it down. Listen, I need to be... <clears throat> keep my suit on properly, sit straight in my pew, look good, make sure I've got my teeth brushed and my hair... No, no, I don't have any hair. Hair done, and uh, I don't want to mess it up, you know. <laughs> Some of you men, I'm so jealous, John. Hold on to your hair all this time, and mine went that 30 some odd years old. Yes, yes, Milan. <laughs> you still got yours. <laughs> Listen, tradition, pride wants you just to look good when you come in and look good when you leave and look good sitting there and doing all the right things and saying the right things and praise the Lord, brother, and it's good to see you and greet everybody and hug everybody. But if there's no releasing yourself to the work of the Holy Ghost in your life. Listen, I don't, we need to allow the Holy Ghost to move. That's what we're coming back to that I talked about at the beginning, right? Kingdom of God is righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. You can't have it except you're in the Holy Ghost. You can't have it in its fullness except in the Holy Ghost. And I get it from time to time where it just feels good. I'm at peace. I got joy. I feel like I'm righteous. And then it's gone in the next moment because somebody just came and complained to me about something. And I need to be back in there again. And it's a struggle. 
It's a struggle when you look at the news and it's a struggle when you, when you hear others that all they can do is complain about the news and, and all the different things that are going on. It's a struggle when all you get is negative to make sure that you're saying, God, you're my positive. Because we're so physical and we're so oh, carnal at times. So I want us to, to engage this struggle. Musicians, you can come. Let's stand together, shall we? My pastor used to preach when my wife and I, uh, yeah, when my wife and I were first in the church, he says, you guys need to get some backbone. You need to put some steel in your backbone and you need to understand that this is a battle and that this is a fight and, and uh, you, we're going to have to engage it. Listen, anybody that tells you, there's a song out there that, said, that t- t- talks about, you know, how we shouldn't have to fight anymore. And it's a well-known group and, and they have so many good songs and then they have this song that we shouldn't fight anymore. And I'm thinking to myself, that's not scriptural. When you enter into this, you've turned around from everything that this world wants you to be, everything that Satan wants you to be, everything that your flesh wants you to be, and you've said, I want to be God. You don't think you're going to have to fight to stay there? You don't think you're going to have to fight to get in there? Satan's going to do whatever he can to stop you. Your flesh is going to do whatever it can to stop you. This world, your friends... Listen, I had two people. When I first started coming to God, I had two people come over. And one was my older brother. Another was a fellow that eventually became my brother-in-law for a time. And they came over. And they had one reason for coming over. They heard I was going to church. So they came over with several cases of beer and their fishing rods. And their whole intent was to take me away from going to church and try and get me drunk and back to that lifestyle that I've been living before, I, before God started intervening and God started changing me. Listen, everything about this world doesn't want you to be a Christian. Everything about this world doesn't want you to be in the Holy Ghost. And here is God on the other side, come on. Come on, just let me fill you with the Holy Ghost. Come on, just empty yourself out. That's the struggle. That's the fight. It's getting rid of self. It's it's saying no to the world. It's saying no to Satan. It's saying no to yourself and saying, God, here I am. You do what you need to in my life. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Engage the struggle. This is war. Can I tell you something? Victory is promised. You say, what if I lose? What if I make mess up? What if I? You're gonna. Can I just tell you? You're gonna mess up along the way, unless you are already glorified, and you are like Jesus in every way, shape, and form of your life. There's gonna be times you're gonna struggle along the way, and you're gonna make. Don't get discouraged. Just get back to the feet of Jesus. Here I am, Lord. I'm gonna empty myself out of this. God, I'm worried about this. God, I've got, I hate this. And God, I'm so bitter about this. God, here I am, back with you again. Lord, you do a work. Fill me with the Holy Ghost as I empty myself out. That's where the struggle is. It's in emptying ourselves out and letting God have His way in our lives. Deliverance is promised, for Jesus is our deliverer. Healing and miracles are available for those that are His, for that's a promise also. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. Can I just tell you one other thing? The souls of others right now. There are people around you right now that that are in desperate need of God in their lives. We are so privileged and so honored to be able to sit as children of God and come to worship together and, and be a participant in church together like we are. But I want you to know there's those out there right now that have not grown up to know God. It's a strange thing. Back when I was little, everybody knew about God. Everybody knew about Jesus. Now you can open up the Bible and people say, what's that all about? I've never even read that. Nobody's ever read that to me. Back when I was young, they used to read the Bible in school before we began. And we'd have prayer before we began. And uh, that was then. That was a long time ago. It's not so anymore. So where are they going to hear? How are they going to know that Jesus can make a difference in their life? 
you and me need to go. Just like the Old Testament, where they had these cities of refuge, and there were ups and downs in the roads, and there were mountains in the way, and there were rocks on the road and, and stuff, and they had, they had priests, apprentice priests that they would send out to the city of refuge. So the one that was the, the revenger, the one that was going to take their life, uh, was chasing them and they had to get to the city of refuge in time but these apprentice priests would go out and they would start shoveling it wasn't glorious work they just filled in a lot of the valleys with some of the heights and I don't know if you've driven out to Tofino lately but they're taking down a whole mountain and filling in down below and making the road wider that's what these priests did they tore down the high spots and leveled it out and And uh, any rocks or obstructions in the way, if there was something growing, they would remove it and and cut it down and get it out of the way. And the rocks, they would roll off to the side so that that there'd be a highway to the city of refuge. And then when they saw that person struggling to get to that city of refuge in the Old Testament, that apprentice priest would go alongside of him, Terry, and and man, he'd grab him and he'd almost grab him. And he'd help him. He'd help him. He'd pull him. And another one on the other side. And they'd hold him under his arms. And they would, they would help him. They'd run with him. If the avenger was getting close to them, they would carry him and they would get him to that city of refuge so that his life would not be lost. So there's lots of others right now. And, and want you to know that this world, their mind, their heart, themselves, Satan are doing everything he, they can, all of those three things, to stop them from coming to a place where they're going to give their lives to God. And here we are. We've got. First thing we need to do, we need to make sure that we engage the battle for our own, our own souls. We need to engage the battle. Not just take it for granted, but engage the battle. Come on. Stand up. Be a soldier. Be a warrior. Don't lay down. Don't just hope that it'll happen. Stand up and be strong. That's what God wants. Be strong, be courageous. How many times did God say that to the children of Israel? For I am with you. Amen. Be strong, be courageous. Stand up. Be a warrior. Take up your weapons. Get, put your armor on. Let's fight this battle for our own souls and then let's fight the battle for the souls of others. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Hey, I thought that would be a really short sermon. God's good. Amen. Amen. I want more of God. There's something in me that just says, God, listen, I mentioned to you that that we've seen miracles. You've maybe seen some miracles in your time. I've seen God raise my cousin's little boy from the dead. I've seen it happen. I was there. I prayed for him along with others. Seen it happen. But I want you to know, I believe that, that God has got the best the more yet to come. I believe there's going to be a revival. We're going to see healings. We're going to see miracles, signs and wonders that this is going to happen right now through through you. That's what God wants to do. He wants to do it through you. But first you've got to engage the struggle. You've got to engage the warfare. Hallelujah. Paul at the end of his life said this, I have fought a good fight. I have stayed my course. And there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness. He didn't, yeah, not for him only, but for all those that will glory in his appearing. Yeah, listen, this is an awesome, awesome thing to be part of the kingdom of God, isn't it? Aren't you glad you're part of the kingdom? Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. This altar is open if you want to come and just talk to God for a while. And uh, I would encourage you to come. And, and if you've kind of succumbed to some things and, and you're struggling with worry and anxiety or, or uh, anger or bitterness or any of it, this altar is open. Just come and give it all. Just give it up. Just give it to God and let Him take care of it all. Hallelujah. 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 Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Come and gather around. Come and pray with uh, somebody. Uh, just come and lay your hands on somebody else. Pray with somebody around here. And uh, let's just seek God together. Sometimes we need another soldier to stand alongside.